Hello, everybody. Welcome. Today I am walking in the gardens. And I'm reflecting on a strange adventure or set of adventures that I had here some time ago. And this is related to my recent spate of recordings. that deal with the problems of abstraction and intellect and the possibility of insight. It's a little windy here today, so there might be some mic noise. I hope you won't find it too uncomfortable. Yesterday, as I was preparing to meditate, I heard the sounds of the local Cooper's Hawk couple, and they were mating. Although we're a little bit past the time when the raptors usually mate, I think we're in a deceptive moon, which comes after the eagle moon in Blackfoot phenological awareness. Sometimes there is an extra moon. And my friend Ryan Firstiver and I were discussing this the other night. Because what determines the deceptive moon is if the raptors don't mate in the cycle that is expected for them. And this year, although the raptors appear to be mating in some places, the geese are not yet doing so at least not in Lethbridge where Ryan lives. And we discussed the possibility that there are two simultaneous things going on. The sun animals and plants are doing their things and the moon animals and plants are doing their things. And normally these are in harmony and when they remain in harmony, there's no deceptive moon. It's a 12 moon cycle, not a 13 moon cycle. And this was a moment of insight, I think, for both of us. I brought it up because there's an Objiwe creation story painting by Wayne Rector, which you can find in my YouTube videos. And it's a, it's a twin story, it's a two brothers story and much like Cain and Abel, the brothers fight. One of them is killed and goes to the underworld. But these two brothers have different animals associated with them in the painting. That's next. One of the brothers has Uh, what looks like a fox and maybe a bear and possibly a crane or woodpecker and the other brother has a rabbit and an elk and a different bird and later in the series which is drawn in a spiral counterclockwise 
we see that one of the brothers is associated with the sun and the other with the moon. And it is probably the moon brother that is killed. This is usually the case in such stories. And the sun brother has a big right hand and the moon brother has a big left hand. Or so it appears in the drawing, the painting. So a few years ago now, I was in the garden one day and I saw two young women looking intently at something a little ways away from them. And as I approached them, it was clear that what they were watching was probably a young red-tailed hawk, though it could have been another species. I don't think it was a Cooper's hawk. And the hawk was doing something confusing. It was hopping. And it would try to fly up, and then it would go back to the ground, and clearly it had a prey, it had captured a prey animal. And it just kept repeating this behavior. Fly up, go back to the ground, get the prey, fly up, go back to the ground, get the prey. And an older Russian woman came to watch with us and they were talking together about the situation. And it became clear to me that the older woman was, <laughs> she was, uh, how shall I put this? Let's say disturbed by the fact that I was paying a lot of attention to the attractive young women and not so much to her. And when I noticed this, when I became aware of it, I changed myself so that I began to pay attention to her. And I was very confused by this behavior of the hawk. I had never seen it before. And I said something which I really felt wasn't right, but I was trying to understand what was happening and I did not have enough information, enough knowledge, enough insight. And I said, it almost appears that the hawk is trying to cache the prey, which is, I don't think, common. I don't think that's a common behavior of hawks. That's a common behavior of corvids, crows and ravens and magpies and such. Now, at this point, I'll pause in the story and mention that I made a video I never posted. And the important part of the story happens during the making of this video. And there are reasons why I did not post the video. They are complex. Uh, but essentially, I came across something that was both very profound and also very upsetting. The video was about, as many of my videos are, problems with human representation. And I'll speak more about that in a moment, but for now I will return to the story. So I began to speak with the older Russian woman. And in her way, she was also quite attractive, but in a very sophisticated way. Not in the same way the young women were. And so we spoke a bit, and I asked her if she would mind a little company because it became clear to me that she knew quite a bit about birds and hawks in particular. Though she did not understand what was going on there either. 
<clears throat> and so we ended up spending the afternoon together, walking around. She spoke of her life in New York, her husband is hunting, and it became clear that she had been a falconer. So she knew quite a bit about hawks and was interested in animals and plants and everything here. And we had a, a wonderful time and I was deeply impressed with her. We didn't figure out what the young hawk was doing. She did, however, mention that it was young. She could tell by its color that it was still, you know, perhaps an adolescent. That was a joyful afternoon. It's always fun to meet someone new who's intelligent and insightful and to speak and learn together. Perhaps a year later, I was in the outdoor nursery. In the rear of the botanical garden and I was making a video about the dangers of human representation when I decided to take off my headset and I wasn't sure if the video audio would continue properly if I did that. So I walked over to some tables, plastic tables, uh, in the place I'm standing right now. And I wanted to take off some of my clothes, it was warm, and to remove my headset and continue making my video. And so I set the camera down and began to do that, still making the video and talking. And I noticed a tall blue barrel, maybe four feet tall, three and a half feet tall, probably two feet in diameter. It's plastic. And uh, <laughs> very thin plastic. And I saw, as I leaned over to take my jacket off, a, a hawk feather behind the barrel. <clears throat> and it was a nice feather. But I also noticed there was some blood on the quill, which I thought was strange. When I was done adjusting my gear, I just happened to look inside the barrel and the barrel was half filled with water and in the water, a hawk had drowned. And I noticed that the hawk's feathers were mostly white, flecked with black but white. And I could see that the hawk had somehow fallen into the barrel. And once it was wet, since the barrel was only about, maybe it had a foot and a half of water in it, the hawk could neither touch the bottom nor fly out. And so it thrashed about in there and drowned. And there was no one to save it. And I was deeply upset but I was also quite confused, and I didn't know what to do. The reason I was confused is that I could not understand how it could be possible that a hawk would end up in this barrel and drown there. I couldn't understand the sequence of events that led to this. I asked various questions and tried to understand and I began to quest in an attempt to gain insight. 
Initially, I had various ideas. They didn't make much sense. I thought perhaps the hawk was trying to get a drink of water, which is senseless since there's water, lots of places to drink. And also, how would it see that there was water in the barrel? But the important feature of the story escaped me at first. And it's linked to the first scene with the women. So for a while I was puzzled and I wrote an essay. And this essay is called The Bird in the Barrel. And you can find it on my Medium page if you care to read it. And there's a picture of the barrel and the hawk in the essay. I continued making the video, but eventually I realized that I had to do something about this tragic situation, and I did not know really what to do. But it occurred to me that the hawk's last wish was simply to be free of this ridiculous, terrifying situation that would never occur in nature, impossible for this to occur. In fact, it was ironic because I was making a video about the dangers of representations and plastic barrels are representations. They're the artifact of a representational animal. And before there were humans, there were no such kinds of traps or cages. A hawk could not die this way unless there was a barrel like this in this situation in the garden. So, I removed the hawk from the barrel and set it on the ground next to the barrel as a gesture of communion with the spirit of the animal and what I understood to be its last most urgent desire. I don't know if that was the right thing to do or a good thing to do. What is right and good is a much more complicated situation than we imagine. For most of the time, we are trapped in an array of thoughts and feelings and historical patterns of behavior and thinking. But I did something. And later I began to reflect on the problem and began to quest to understand what had happened. And most of my initial theories really did not please me. It didn't make a lot of sense to me. And they were the kinds of typical things that humans who don't know much about hawks would think. But because I had interacted with the situation and I was deeply moved and passionate about chasing it, I think I eventually came to understand what happened. And it's a, a beautiful metaphor for the problem of the distinction between abstraction and intellect and insight. <clears throat> Eventually, I came to an insight about the hawk that I trust. Whether or not it is perfectly true is not important. It taught me something very valuable, and so I'll share it with you. I had to think back to the situation with the women and the hawk try to understand what was happening there. The hawk would grasp the prey, fly up, drop the prey, come back, grasp the prey, fly up, drop the prey, over and over again. Well, 
so eventually, because I've had similar experience myself, I came to realize that the nervous systems of young or inexperienced animals sometimes develop along specific paths in a sequence. The reason that I realized this was partly due to help from maybe the hawks, but partly due to insight about my own experience trying to learn difficult things. When I began to learn guitar, it was very difficult to both sing and play the guitar. My nervous system, there was a division between these two activities. And so I would struggle, and as I would begin to sing, the rhythm of the singing might be different from the rhythm of the playing. And I had to, I had a difficult time learning how to do it. And something similar happens when we learn how to ride a bike or many other things where there are two different sort of neurological features that we are in a state where you can do one or the other, but not yet both. And over time with practice, we may learn to do both. And so what I realized was that the young hawk, the red tail, that we had seen was demonstrating a problem and trying to learn, sorry about the siren, how to do two things at once that were in conflict in its nervous system. You see the young hawks they learn how to grasp the branch that they are clinging to. And then when they go to fly, they have to release their grasp and then they can fly. But in order to carry prey up to a tree branch where it can be safely consumed, the hawk has to both grasp and fly. And the young hawks have not yet mastered this in a certain life phase. And so they cannot both grasp and fly. They must do one or the other. And this explains what the red tail was doing. But it turns out that this is a crucial feature of how most likely the young hawk became trapped in the barrel. The other problem for the young hawk that died in the barrel is that the edge of the barrel is very thin. There's nothing like <clears throat> that construct in nature. A half a centimeter of plastic in a circle, it cannot be grasped by the hawk's claws. A very small bird might be able to stand on that edge without much trouble, but a large bird cannot. And so what happened is that the fledgling Cooper's hawk was exploring and it flew up to the edge of the barrel tried to grasp it, in, <coughs> in trying to grasp it, it could no longer fly. And as it tried to grasp that very thin edge between its claws, it fell forward into the barrel and could not fly. And once it was drenched with water, it could not escape the barrel. and drown there. An older hawk would have been able to fly up to the edge of the barrel, though it would never have done this, for it would not have been exploring in that way. 
just curiously hopping, half flying about and looking around and exploring the world like the young hawk must have been doing. An older hawk would not do this. So, the curiosity of the young hawk, its naturally playful, explorative way of being in the world, led it to the edge of the barrel. For a moment, it attempted to grasp that edge. It failed, it fell forward into the barrel was quickly soaked and struggled and drowned over time. And why do I think this is an important analogy? <laughs> because the intellect and abstraction are very much about grasping things. And insight is very much like flying. You don't have to grasp anything. You fly above, you see from above, and what was previously distinct, in a flash, is reunited into unity. And all of the features that are shared by the things that were distinct suddenly emerge to awareness in a beautiful or astonishing way. And we humans are trained to grasp the representations and abstractions, but we are not trained to unify. Some of us develop some degree of the skill over time. And so we stay like the young hawk. We can grasp. And most of us cannot even fly in our minds. So even though we are made for the skies of insight like the hawk, we remain creatures of, we are trapped, trapped on the grasping ground. And many of us do not even discover our wings. And this is tragic. And we drown in the barrel of abstractions and representations and words and ideas, evaluations, explanations, and so forth. <clears throat> and for many of us, this becomes a lifelong trap. As we get older, we crystallize more and more into the problem. forgetting that we were born for the sky of insight. We were born not merely with a single kind of wings, but with wings that fly in many different dimensions, different sets of wings. Each pair flies in a different domain of seeing or relating, discovering, unifying, experiencing insight. And this is a story about how nature teaches us about ourselves if we're paying close attention if we have the awareness with which to passionately explore and attempt to recover our wings, not merely for ourselves, but for all beings or for all people or for the people we love, the people we encounter. And it's much better when we do this together. And most of the great writers and speakers and teachers, they know this. They know that when we come together, our passion and capacity 
<clears throat> for learning and development and transformation is dramatically amplified. And this is why it is nice to gather together for this purpose. Hmm. A Stellar's Jay has just taken a peanut from my hand. And that's a very complex maneuver because the Jay must fly, very briefly land on my hand, and catch the peanut in its beak in the process of flying and briefly grasping on my hand. So you can see the synchronization of diverse neural systems there if we're thinking about this neurologically. Had the young hawk been a bit older, had it learned to both grasp and fly, the moment that it landed on the edge of the barrel, it would have released its grasp and flown away. It would have just touched the edge of the barrel. Oh, here's actually probably one of its parents right now. Yeah, I, see, I see the Cooper's hawk female. And she is looking right at the place where this happened at this moment while I'm speaking with you. Probably this is the mother of the bird who died there. I do not know if she knows that this happened, but it seems unlikely that she's unaware of it. Though I also doubt <coughs> that she thinks of it in the way that a human would, or remembers it in the way that a human might. Such a regal and powerful animal. I've had unique adventures with this pair of Cooper's Hawks, which I'll not hear detail. But let us say I know them well, and they know me as well. Grasping and flying. To fly, she must release the branch. But if she captures prey, she can grasp the prey and take it to a branch where it is safe to consume it. When we have developed the capacity for insight, we are similarly, similarly freed from the problems of the grasping intellect and the, com the compelling superficial attraction of abstractions. Then we may use them with greater safety and liberation. Then we can mix them together with insight as the foundation and what we are seeking rather than just satisfying ourselves that we have grasped something, which is too easy to do, the low-hanging fruit of cognition. So I honor this place and these animals today and my relationship with them and with you and with the incredible minds that are the potential inheritance of our kind of animal, but one so rarely accomplished, enacted, embodied. You know, we face many threats. When we are young, the mind of insight is more accessible. <clears throat> But over time, we structure habits and behaviors and we are influenced by our culture and our, the people we relate with, our families, friends at school, the schools themselves. And almost all of these reward grasping. 
Where is insight rewarded? In the classroom, the child who sees a better method than the one the teacher is teaching is often castigated for presenting it. So many of us form the experience of having been punished for having insight and, having, and being rewarded for having a superficial grasp of some technique or method or the produce that leads to academic knowledge, clinical knowledge about what we refer to as subjects history, mathematics, social sciences, physical education, life skills, so on. But the fundamental ache in all of us is not for these superficial things, it is for insight. For our original nature is pure insight, unadulterated by its own produce. It releases its produce for the sake of achieving flight, for the sake of achieving insight. And the things we are most curious about deep in our hearts are the big questions of birth and death and what is the world and... Hello. Hello. Nice to see you. Nice to see you too. Thank you. We ache to know, and not just know, but embody our original nature, which is free of all accoutrement. It's not a thing of things. It's not a thing at all. It is the verb, the moving, flowing transformation, not the noun, the thing, the derived object, the abstraction. The class, the instance, the object. I hope you have enjoyed my story and that you may receive some useful benefit from it in your own quests and in the passionate core of your heart, your soul, your being, your humanity. Perhaps the young hawk gave us a gift at the cost of its life, a precious and irrevocable gift of insight and understanding, of awareness and hope. Thank you for joining me. I look forward to learning together again sometime soon. Bye-bye for now.